Hi, I think we're live. Um, so uh, this is a session on uh, the shape of contemporary art right now. My name is Dominic Wilsden. I'm the uh, director of the Institute for Contemporary Art at the Virginia Commonwealth University in the United States. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce uh, uh, our, our, our group here uh, in a second uh, when they do their Kind of initial contributions to the to the, the topic, and then we'll, we'll have a, a conversation um, among us as a group uh, for the for the, the time that we have here. Um, I want to begin by saying that you know the brief that we have for this session, um, which you can read, uh, assume a number of things. There's uh, the sense that contemporary art is. Um, shaped by societal forces and evolves uh, with society. And there's also the sense there, which seems uh, not strange to start with, that the contemporary is a period. Um, but in many ways, I think lots of us who are involved in contemporary art uh, know that the contemporary is a uh, stranger thing than that and and so ambiguous in many ways some ways it is a it is a period people can you know when it gets taught in school in college um people teach the contemporary perhaps from the 1960s when you know, many of the artists who are still with us uh emerged and the, so they are still our contemporaries biologically and uh, uh and also you know it's clear that in the 60s there was a certain paradigm shift in the forms of contemporary art and uh, could be argued that we are still in some way within that paradigm. Um, but that's a discussion that we might have in the minutes that we have together now. Uh, another starting point for the contemporary as a period that sometimes gets put forward is 1990. Um, the be beginning and end of many things and uh, uh, beginning of a period of much greater globalization in the, uh, the, the perception of contemporary art. And in fact, uh, you could say a shift from a historical to a geographic uh, framework for what for how contemporary art is understood. Um, and then of course, you've got the idea of the contemporary as current, a much more uh, ill-defined sense of, of a period. Um, so we're gonna try and dig into some of this. Um, it's worth saying also though, the contemporary in some ways is the absence of periods. Uh, we're in a phase now and have been for quite a while in which uh, there's, a, there's a general plurism, plurism of forms and tendencies, many things happening at once, uh, and uh, including uh, practices that are uh, futuristic and practices that are nostalgic and all sorts of temporalities in between that. Um, I saw a, a great exhibition uh, this past weekend at the Herschel Museum in Washington, D.C. Of, of Laurie Anderson. And there's a, there's a quote in one of her immersive works, a quote from John Cage, which simply says, less like an object and more like the weather. And sometimes I think of the contemporary contemporary art as a bit more like the weather. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, without boundaries. It's uh, kind of permanent uh, and yet cyclical. Um, and so I think maybe with our, uh, our time here together uh, in this session, we're going to do something, a little weather report on <laughs> what we might mean by the contemporary right now and maybe some of the features of the current climate. Uh, so we're going to uh, we have we're going to go through in a little order here. And I'm actually going to begin with Tom Trevor, who's associate professor of contemporary art at the University of Exeter in the UK. And Tom, I know you've got some thoughts on this question of, of periodization and what the contemporary is, the, the time frame. Tom. Oh, thanks so much, Dominic. Yes, um, absolutely. Actually, I, I have to say this is this feels very uh, contemporary, this uh, Horace's experience at uh, 6.15 here in the UK, uh, meeting all together online like this, uh, definitely post-COVID um, situation, I would say. Um, great to be here. And yeah, actually, as you say, picking up on this idea of how, how do we periodize this contemporary moment or as you say perhaps perhaps that that doesn't work anymore that idea but um i thought it would be useful to set context for our conversation really to talk about well to revisit if you like that um question what is the contemporary georgio gambon's question and obviously um 
you know, the derivation of that term means literally together in time, but that could apply to any um, moment historically. So what is it specifically about our contemporary now, this historical present? And I think you have to refer back to modernism and the difference, really. Um, and, you know, if perhaps that sort of 20th century version of, of modernism had a really strong idea of the future, where we are going to. There's going to be change. There's going to be change for the better. Society will transform. And uh, a kind of belief in that. And that was also within contemporary art. That Therefore, there was a role for the avant-garde to con continually refresh and bring in new ideas and experimentation. And it's interesting you talked about uh, really that uh, milestone. When when did we shift from the modern to the contemporary? And um, uh, actually, Peter Osborne talks about uh, three different potential milestones. You know, you talked about the 60s, that post-conceptual moment, of Paris Spring, so forth. And probably the most, uh, I, I, I would say, the, the kind of the moment that people really kind of uh, stick to now is um, fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989, post-communism. But actually, uh, some people are even looking further back to the kind of post-war, uh, year zero, 1945. Obviously, the, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London was established in 46, I think it was, by Roland Penrose. In some ways, that sort of continued the European um, avant-garde, uh, you know, from surrealism, which is kind of a counter to that American... Um, late modernist um, uh, approach in the 50s and so forth. But here we are. So if you like, in contrast to that kind of clear trajectory into the future, I would say the contemporary is really characterised by this kind of um, confluence of multiple different temporalities. We are talking about times, many different worlds coming together and actually without any clear understanding of, of the future. So as if we're kind of caught in this sort of permanent present. So in a way, I, one of the characteristics of the contemporary is, is uncertainty, actually, about where we're going. And, um, uh, you know, you can sort of contrast different sort of subjectivities as part of that. So thinking about in modernism, this kind of idea of a collective struggle that's going to change things. And now we have this kind of multiple subjectivities, which isn't really kind of uh, finding any kind of commonality. And then in terms of spatio-temporal forms, thinking about modernism as internationalist and uh, kind of, as I say, struggling to change society. Actually, now we're in this global transnational situation and it feels like we're in a kind of stasis. And then in terms of, uh, if you like, this kind of nationalism, the idea of borders and, and nation states in, in modernism has shifted to this global circulation of, labor and diaspora so Giatri Spivak talks a lot about those flows of people and then we think about um in the in the new digital network society the uh, actually um uh uh this kind of space of flows if you like uh, Manuel Castells talks about and similarly uh you know kind of uh obviously the environmental crisis but also these kind of new biopolitics, changing our, our kind of sense of, of, of the body as well. And uh, if we kind of speed up to our contemporary contemporary, if you like, you know, we've got, we've got we've, uh, in this um, new millennium, obviously we've had 9-11, the banking collapse, Trump, goodness me, uh, and, you know, really the coronavirus is such an important um, shift. Here we are in this, in this global uh, conference speaking online which we probably wouldn't be, have been doing before the pandemic so thinking about these kind of particular features of our contemporary moment the digital contemporary we've had the Cambridge Analytica me too uh, Black Lives Matter that's kind of radical shift the, the, in terms of the climate contemporary thinking about you know I mean Gre Greta Thunberg these uh, COP26 and so forth well even thinking about just the idea of the Anthropocene and our kind of human impact is, is kind of relatively contemporary. But I think um, most specifically in, in the UK, at least, it's the decolonial uh, argument that is really kind of shifting uh -huh. the context. And, you know, um, referring again to modernism is so bound up with the history of colonialism, absolutely, you know, inextricable. And actually now we have voices from the global south saying, 
this idea of a universalism, this idea of a kind of shared knowledge is, is Eurocentric. And actually, we need to uh, actually de-link different histories. You, you talked about a, a, a plural, plurality, excuse me, it's too early in the morning to say that, a, a kind of pluriverse, if you like, of different histories and different modernisms. So I think actually the, the real um, turning point, the tipping point for our contemporary is actually this decolonization process. And if we see that, uh, actually, this kind of idea of universities as being specifically a Eurocentric Western kind of, um, uh, actually kind of epistemic violence, this is the, the argument, but actually we need to humble that and listen and allow different voices. And that's perhaps part of what you'd referred to as a deglobalization too. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting moment. But the key things for us now, Ukraine, and the COVID-19 right now, mm -hmm. and how that's going to shift the contemporary. I think mm -hmm. that's my time up, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Tom. Well, um, uh, uh, Lena Kramer is curator at the Kunsthalle Mans. And uh, Lena, I know you you uh, worked on the the, uh, the Berlin Biennial in 2016. And there was the, 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 the theme of contemporary and post-contemporary was already active right then. Um, what's, your, what's your take on this from this vantage point now in 2022? Yes. Um, first of all, many thanks for the invitation and many thanks, Tom, for opening up with some broad perspectives that I can jump right in. I was wondering um, how we can understand the post-contemporary practice as a practice against the new normal, I would say, as uh, against maybe power structures that have been established over time and need to be critically reshaped. Thus, maybe which role do artists, designers, thinkers, creatives as avant-garde, as we call them sometimes, for our society in general play in this post-contemporary understanding. I would argue where we're not, where if not in the field of artistic or aesthetics, we are able to, to find resources and new ground to rethink our society and emphasize structural and fundamental changes. And maybe arguing a bit with, or back that up with French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, who pointed out nearly two decades ago that in order to Search a new path into the post contemporary, we have to overcome the quote symbolic miseries, as he calls it, of our times. And as he further elaborates on that, to rediscover the fundamental connection between aesthetics and politics to overcome these, which I find highly interesting that you combine these two aesthetics and politics. And with symbolic miseries, he's pointing out to social injustice such as white supremacy and insurrection. <laughs> bad word for 7 a.m. That's the name one. And by Kita Steller, who was part of the Knights Berlin Biennale and who's also a great thinker, I would argue, um, is referring to Stiegler and updating his, his attempt on the post-contemporary, demanding that it's absolutely clear um, that the question of how to build a sustainable artwork can only be posed as a political challenge. So she's also combining politics and and the art world. And following her argumentation, the current state of cultural practices as well as aesthetic practices must be undertaking a critical reflection, she argues. And as such a critical reflection or as a case study, we can like maybe start a conversation on, I would argue with the Ninth Berlin Biennale taking place in 2016, curated by New York collective DIS. They are consisting of Lauren Boyle, Mark Rosso, Solomon Chase and David Toro with a catchy title, The Prisoner's Track, and quoting from their curatorial statement, it says the following. Exhibitions have increasingly become, become tattered, theaters of competences. There's a pleasure principle at play, not too different from disaster films or horror mo movies. Welcome to the post-contemporary. The future feels like the past, familiar, predictable, immutable, leaving the present with uncertainties of the future. Is Donald Trump going to be the president? Is wheat poisonous? Is Iraq a country? Is France a democracy? Do I like Shakira? Am I suffering from depressions? Are we at war? If uh, it is the present that is unknowable, unpredictable and uncomprehensible, forget by a present's commitment to set a fiction. There is nothing particularly realistic about the world today, a world in which investing in fiction is more profitable than being on reality. 
It is the genre shift from science fiction to fantasy, which makes its inspiring open up for grabs non-binary. The supergroups, as they call it, of artists, collaborators that we have mobilized are not fatigued, but energized by the uncertainty. In this climate, anyone can begin to build an alternative present. So we imagine the city of Berlin driven by these energies. Pariser Platz is our point of departure. So with over 40 artists, designers, authors, amongst others, in invited or involved in the Biennale, offered also <laughs> with a floating venue that was like kind of a past and a present track all over the city, mm -hmm. um, as well as a, div a, a diverse public programming. And besides only one all commissioned works, um, the Bayanya set new, new, I would say, <laughs> like new, new, how you say it? Like, not boundaries. New, uh, new, like, things for how to work between like artists and their collaborators. Um, the practice, I would argue, from this is clearly like a cross disciplinary practice, and that by posing social and political questions that were on stake, they invite the artist or the artist list was like by that. Um, also, understanding artists as collaborators, calling them a super group of humans that needs to be mobilized in order to face the uncertainties that they are describing in their curatorial statement. I would argue that this new way of thinking, the relationship between curators and contributors of this exhibition also like shaped our way of how or my way of how to see like this post-contemporary practice, how to how can get to that post-contemporary practice which we need. That being said, like I'm very help or I'm very open to further questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, I mean, it's at least a couple of things going on in, in what you said there that I'm sure we'll not have time to dig into too much. Yeah. But one is like the, the kind of expansion of the idea of the artists and the rise of collectives. And, uh, you know, we know we were talking about documented before we came on and went yeah. live. And, you know, that's that's uh, the nature of that. But also just the the fact of the of biennials and, and different sorts of institution, different sorts of exhibitionary platform that have characterized, um, you know, the period that we call contemporary. Um, but thank you. I'm going to go to, uh, to uh, Helen Frederick next, who's not far from me in the Washington, D.C. area. And, yeah, you guys are lucky with, like, 7 a.m. You, you should be so lucky. We're at 1.30 a.m. on the East Coast of the U.S. So, Helen. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> really lovely to be here with you all. And uh, I'm going to show some eye candy. And also, going back to what you said, uh, Dominique, about the 60s, because I'm of that period, and also I worked very closely with the postmodernist Diderot, and he was a great influence at Rhode Island School of Design, my alma mater. Uh -huh. uh, but what I'm going to try and do today is talk about something we already know, that we're transcending the parameters of traditional art forms and looking at new environmentally concerned collectives born from larger questions of existential importance. We have stories we need to tell, right? And we talked a little bit about uncertainties and floating spaces and TED Talks and all of this sort of thing. I think that um, I just want to mention that the two showcases in, in addition to Giacomenta that everyone's focused on at this time of year is the Venice Biennale and, and the Whitney Biennial. And what's so important about the Venice Biennale for me this year is that it focused on women. Cecilia Alamani was the first Italian woman curator in the history of the Biennale. And she used the title, The Milk of Dreams from Leonora Carrington, uh, which was a British born Mexican artist. And also uh, Ramona Zaro and Kay Sage were featured highly in, in the Biennale. So only 10% of the uh, population of presenters identified as men. That's a really big breakthrough in, in this kind of post-contemporary. In terms of the Whitney Biennial, although I haven't seen it, the title Quiet As Is Kept uh, seems to me to examine the contracted, improvised, and blurred time from the pandemic. So if we're looking how we're wheeling out of that uncertainty, I think that becomes a very huge uh, post-contemporary idea. And um, I think that artists are really looking at myths and protests and metaphors. They're collaborating more often than not to inspire understanding and transformative experiences that 
are universally about humanity and our survival. So let's go to the next one, Pato. Thank you so much for helping me. I'm sorry my images are um, a little small. So I thought I would show you something about um, a hyper-reality, a hyper-local reality here in Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. I've been involved in coordinating an exhibit called Suspended Inner Spaces. So we're talking about suspended time, many of us. And I think this show came together after three years because of COVID. It took a long time. And it was not only a three-year project, it was exhibited in three galleries in a nonprofit called BizArts. And the probe was to really look at the time from contextualizing an idea, going through suspended space or whatever it took to get to the final production. And so it was kind of a magical inner space discovered in the investigation of the studio practice where life and distillation meet. And I think that that's a very important subject right now, propelled by COVID, but also always of interest to artists. So we looked at... Uh, the profane, the sacred, superstition, uh, myths, and reality. We had different groups that got together, and then they very soon crossed over and became new groups and highly collaborative. Next one, please. I'll just show you a few pieces from that show. One is a young artist, Bridget Lambert, young, she's 50, um, who has been working a long time with this idea of the diorama and, and taking up found objects uh, for different periods of time into these digital images. And these are overlaid on a wallpaper that she also creates, a very, very detailed wallpaper. And the title is My Dream Won't Be Complete Without You. So she's taking these ready-made elements and producing very puzzling dioramas for us to ponder. And I think amongst all the digit digitized work that we're seeing, hers is pretty spectacular in relationships of uh, human conditions. The next one, Pado, thank you. This is an Indian artist, Shante Chandrasekhar. Um, she is physically demandingly doing handwork based on science. And this is called macrostates and microstates. And hundreds of punch holes uh, completed these circles, which really deals with the randomness in physical systems. The interesting point about this, and the reason I'm showing it is, until she started to install it, she didn't know how she was going to complete it. So the res residue on the floor came as part of the installation process. And the next one is Brazilian artist Maria Barbosa, just before, after, and it's a piece with sound, textiles, leaves, and video. And it symbolizes the Hispanic asylum seeker's journey as metaphorically linked to the cottonwood tree. So you hear that sound of the trees and on the floor are these hundreds of leaves. And in a jar is this metallic uh, material that represents the blankets that hundreds of um, seek, uh, asylum seekers at the Mexican border are covered in. But she made a more comforting blanket that's on the floor, a hand embroidered it so that you go in the journey of the asylum seekers through that blanket, as well as the blanket of the leaves. And then I took the liberty of the last one showing my own work because I am an artist as well as a curator and educator. And this show was very important to me because I could put together two polarities that I think also are very, very a part of the contemporary era. And so it's called suspension, space, silence, faltering. The, insp the inspirations are from um, border walls, not only Mexico, U.S., many border walls, and fences near shrines where prayers are hung. There you see Chimayo in New Mexico, a fence with all these amazing prayers and the border between Mexico and the U.S. And the last slide, Pato, thank you. So my piece was really asking people to intervene. Uh, it started with that central part, which is six gridded panels and um, a round form that has like a noose, uh, uh, interpreting kind of a suspended uh, uh, uncertainty, uh, kind of a brutality. On the floor are cast legs and burlap bags that asylum seekers might carry their belongings in and so forth, and different detritus. So it asked the public to come and put things on the wall. And after the two month period, the wall you can see was filled with, with their messages of detritus and debris and specific localities 
that had affected their lives. So to end, this is an attempt to break down boundaries between art and the public by calling for active participation and making subjective perception a significant component of the work. And these are some of the elements I see representing the post-contemporary era. Of course, I, I instigated um, concepts by putting up all these flags from Afghanistan, Africa, Jordan, Somalia, Syria, and the Ukraine poster, which Colin mentioned also is one of our great concerns right now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Appreciate having having the images in the in the in the conversation like that. Um, let me just say before we uh, go to, to Pat O'Hare, but um, we should we should uh, mute ourselves when we're not talking. I think that's better for the sound for for, for folks. Um, so, so Pato, um, uh, artist, educator, cultural worker, based uh, between LA and New York, right? And New York tonight. Um, so uh, uh, let's let's pass to you. Thank you, Dominic. I'm very grateful to be here this evening in New York, but this morning in many other parts of the world and afternoon. My talk is titled Lingering, which is the name of my recent solo exhibition at Pitzer College near Los Angeles. And I want to ask us to think about COVID time in relationship to the contemporary and as a way to query what I think Tom beautifully laid out, um, multiple temporalities, what journalist Ed Young is calling the pandemicene our current moment when climate change and habitat loss have created dramatic interspecies dialogues. And I've been living one version of this interspecies dialogue since I became infected in March 2020, so very early in the pandemic. I'm what is colloquially known in the U.S. and many English-speaking countries as a COVID long hauler. I continue to experience myriad ongoing symptoms more than two years after being infected. In working with others to try to respond to COVID, one key practice has been dueling, holding space with and for people in times of transition. An example of this and another key framework is Christine Miserandino's spoon theory. We start each day with a finite amount of energy. Getting out of bed or brushing your teeth each use up a valuable amount of your limited energy or your spoons. This has been a useful reorientation against workaholism and capitalism's notion of productivity for me. I give myself permission and heed many other people's guidance to not overdo it. This is one kind of COVID time. Place helps. So Legion Park in Los Angeles has been instrumental to my healing. It's a vibrant, free, open public space so crucial to the city and immigrant communities especially during this pandemic when people need to be together outside. It's full of many types of trees, including the eucalyptus, which is not indigenous to California. They're only present on Tongva land through settler colonialism. There's a gorgeous giant eucalyptus tree that lost a limb in a 2020 storm. You can see there in the center of the photograph, the remaining part attached to the trunk. I studied this fallen limb for months and months as I was walking and thinking about spoon theory, relations and cycles of time, geological time, storm time, decolonial time, long hauling time. I couldn't do more vigorous exercise beyond walking. Exertion itself can do harm for some people living with chronic illness. I salvaged some of that fallen wood. I've been transforming it into a series of spoons that are also conceptual artworks. This piece is called variant one. The vaccines and the Delta and Omicron variants created different kinds of COVID times, as does the transformation of this fallen eucalyptus limb. These different scales of time have implications for different forms of care. I feel I am tending to that complicated tree and this place that has tended to me. Here we see a roller coaster of a spoon with a bowl that cannot be filled or hold anything and this sculpture is called pacing. Whenever I go to a clinic, they give me a disposable surgical mask. I've been saving them since early 20, April 2020 when I went to urgent care because I was having trouble breathing. And this is a selfie from that day. I've had these masks electroplated in nickel, an unprecious metal that looks silverish. I have 26 of these masks, now 27, from my COVID visits. The series is called No Silver Linings. 
long hauling, and is presented on three gallery walls as a timeline of my interfacing with the medical establishment. Here, we have some of the most recent from just last December, my pre-op surgery and SIBO breath test masks. Way back in the second month of being sick, better but not well became my standard reply to people's loving, concerned, and sometimes incredulous questions about how I am feeling. This piece is made of charred, salvaged California live oak, so what you see as black text is charred wood, and salvaged metal auto parts from a burned out car that I came upon in the park during a walk. Pacing, the practice of pacing, and care help greatly, as do mutual aid and community. Vaccines and boosters are vital. They're only part of the ongoing changes we need. I would suggest that art is also vital, as is countering social isolation and ensuring vibrant, safe interconnectedness with one another. This piece is called Hold Me. The work gives a sense of something transformed. I am something and someone transformed in these asymmetrical COVID contemporaneities. And I'll close with this piece from the exhibition. It's called Talking in Circles. It anchored the center of the front room of the exhibition. It's informed by the circles spray painted by public health officials in urban parks, such as here in New York City's Domino Park in an image by Eduardo Munoz for Reuters. Talking in Circles is made from mirrored gold acrylic, evoking the chintzy aesthetic so favored by the former US president who willfully lied and obfuscated. The piece appears in a typeface that designer Mark Davis digitized from the former president's handwriting and named Tiny Hands. The piece Talking in Circles quotes the former president who said early on in the pandemic, quote, it's going to disappear one day. It's like a miracle. It will disappear, end quote. These are some of the ways in which I've been engaging with a visceral conceptual art that embodies different kinds of COVID temporalities, accountabilities, and relations. Thank you. That was beautiful, Pato. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, we, it, it, there's, there's so much around care that, has, that is in the art discourse now that wasn't, I think, so much the case five, ten years ago. And it it's, uh, wasn't only driven by the, by the pandemic, but has so much been amplified by, by the experience of that. Um, uh, lastly, I'm going to go to, to, to Lillian Chan, who's the senior manager of the K, K11 Art Foundation in Hong Kong. And um, Lillian, uh, I think you're, yeah. you're going to speak to the present and maybe the future too, huh? Yes, because um, thank you very much for your invitation, the first. And, and uh, yeah, we, we uh, just like I said uh, previous to our panel, that I'm quite intrigued uh, by this um, current situation of the, um, the COVID or the, the technology part. And um, with the pandemic followed by a series of world-changing global issues or factors influencing the art ecosystem has been very much disrupted. Uh, we're now much more decentralized and democratized, uh, whereas in the past maybe is um, more centralized at the museums or collectors or, or artist side. And in contrast to the more one-way presentation or transmission of art and messages, the community is now looking for very non-linear communication and understanding of art. We're more like a network than linear communication, which we, I, I see this may be a challenge or opportunity. And that's why we also uh, think that uh, education and maybe exchange uh, will become a very key element in an era that where f especially physical communication and appreciation of art may not be always possible. And uh, as a new institution, we also um, try to use and combine technology for our viewing experience. We use adaptation of VR, AR, multi-sensory, virtual tours, 3D technology. I think um, the, all the other um, international museums and cultural institutions are trying to bring innovative uh, moments to the audience too. And... Uh, for uh, I, I noticed that Lina also um, mentioned about the 
rise of the art collectives. And probably this is also due to the technology that given we have very specialized roles between engineer or different different roles. And that that's why we also uh, see a lot of uprise of um, art collectives. And and we um, I, I especially uh, uh, appreciate uh, what LEGMA is doing uh, with their Art Plus Technology Lab, which is a very good uh, supporting all the experiments and creative entrepreneurship with curatorial involved by uh, both leading the trend, but not yet interrupting the traditional art, which is a very good example. And uh, we also see FAIR that innovated first and now adapting back to the existing art ecosystems, such as the digital art foundation and to catch up the um the trend curate the show uh sell the works and now back to the society and continue exploring uh, um the digital art fair also shows the new sector of art uh adapting to the traditional art ecosystem um, after the innovation so we see the the rise of the technology and how does it combine with um our um, original traditional world i think um this is quite an interesting area and because of with the difficulty of traveling uh institutions now are very eager to maintain the presence and influence overseas and then so we turn into a lot of partnerships and collaborations with overseas institutions uh, to bring programs across countries and maintain exchanges um among the artists for example um um K11 Art Foundation has recently uh, collaborated uh, with the Mori Art Museum from Japan um, to bring artists, educators, curators together in a panel to to explore different, say, how the pandemic um, is influencing arts. Um, although it's a closed door discussion, but uh, we also see the slash identity among different, um, we no longer have pure artists, pure curators. We are all switching our identi identities. Um, so um, uh, in future, I think uh, we also, uh, we, we want to continue with this uh, education and learning um, programs uh, to, to, I think this is the way we, how we communicate uh, with our audience. And, um, yeah, but I think uh, there is a, because I see our uh, time is running out. And so uh, maybe I jump to my, my conclusion. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the key points I would like to uh, delve into is how we see the, uh, how we go back to basic, because we are now in, uh, in the era of technology, which I, I think I have more questions than the answers, uh, especially with the trend of NFT, whether NFT is art or how institutions should have a take on NFT or related subject. But I think um, with all the uh, current situations happening in the world, the wars, the natural hazards, I think it's more important for human race to go back to basic, how we, we, uh, we can bring balance, well-being, understanding back to human race. I think that's what I personally would like to see um, the, the, the contemporary art world would like to do together to, to bring a better future. Yeah, of course, this is, uh, as you said, is uncertainties, totally. Yeah, so maybe this is my sharing. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Lillian, I appreciate that. Um, maybe uh, for, the, for the few minutes we have left, just to get a... Um, uh, like a, a, it might be a final th uh, thought from each of you. Um, there's a couple of things that that, that uh, uh, come to the surface for me uh, listening to you all. Um, one is to do with, and Lillian, you ended on this, to do with the nature of our art institutions. Everything that we've said around the, the plurality, the multiplicity, uh, the eclecticism of contemporary art, um, the way in which contemporary art is is sometimes art as engineering, art as activism, art as healing. Um, more and more, it seems like um, that contemporary art is actually a space. You, 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 you know it's contemporary art because it happened in a contemporary art space of one kind or another. So uh, you know, I'd be interested in your, uh, your thoughts, any of you, on what kinds of institutions we need uh, or what kinds, of in what kinds of contemporary art institutions would have value and 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 benefit us as a society 
uh, in our different societies, uh, you know, in these now and in these next few years. And the other thought, you could pick this one too, is around, um, you know, we're in a global conference here and there's more and more talk about um, the fate of the global um, and, and, you know, the experience of the pandemic has returned us to local experience in all sorts of ways, but also to new kinds of global experience like the one we're having now. So maybe some last thoughts. You could pick one of those two themes, if you wish, or, or, or a third one. Um, but uh, maybe we'll just go around again. It could be in any order, some thoughts on the, these themes that emerge. Yes, I think as uh, institutions, um, yeah, uh, I think it's um, if the reality is, is really cruel to seeing all the wars, um, all the hazards happening. But I think uh, we, I, I, I think uh, as institution, we need to give voices to 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 individuals to um, say, I, I'm very glad that uh, actually Helen also mentioned about the Venice Biennale, say that the female voices. This year is, um, we finally have um, women outnumbering the male artists. And I think uh, more than women, uh, more uh, about minorities. I, I hope in future, uh, we, we as institutions can make um, those minorities' voices heard. And uh, yeah, this is uh, what personally I, I would like to yeah, see. Yeah, how about the others? I would pick up on what you're saying in terms of partnerships, how important they are, international partnerships, and in terms of the artist role, residencies. I'm the organizational curator for the Kala Chapa in India, uh, and it has uh, a number of programs with universities there that we're also bringing to the U.S. and hoping now there's a conference in Paris to, you know, to deal with the Institut Francais and so forth. But I think we can't leave out how important those partnerships and the residencies are. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, we, we also, uh, for, for uh, just I mentioned about our collaboration with Molly Art Museum, is uh, we want to bring not only artists, but uh, also curators, educators from different disciplines. And then because it can encourage um, different uh, people with different mindsets can, can communicate and we really hope that we can have physical exchange um, next year. I don't know whether international travel is uh, allowed. And we also plan to to um, launch some international uh, art residency to bring uh, artists or curators or people from different practices uh, to Hong Kong and maybe to also to, to uh, China, to, to different uh, cities in China as well, to... Because um, we are, um, you know, uh, the current world, we have different geopolitical environment changes. And I, I think understanding is the key to, to for people with different backgrounds to understand each other. Thank you. Um, there's a, a Mexican sociologist called Juan de Vazquez who... Um, as part of that Latin American discussion around uh, decoloniality, who says that we're coming to the end of the contemporary. The contemporary is a, a kind of aftermath of modernism. And actually, he's the person who talks about um, modernism needing to be humble and listen. And uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted because uh, all of these institutions we've been discussing, I, I kind of cherish, and I think it's really important to hold on to institutions. I, I'm, actually, I... You know, I, I enjoy biennials, but as um, Dominic says, they're a kind of, um, they are the exhibitionary form of globalization, aren't they? So if we're coming into a deglobalized era, um, I think those uh, institutions are going to um, exactly. uh, hang with us. Yeah. So we need to rethink our relationships. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of, I mean, Obviously, the white cube is a kind of hangover of, of uh, uh, modernism. But um, where are we going to go with our biennials in this in this kind of environmental crisis? <clears throat> well, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, the, the the biennial question is a, is a uh, interesting one. Um, you know, we, we, the ones we referred to in this conversation: Venice, uh, Berlin, uh, Whitney Biennial, Museum Biennial. There are in Europe, North America, but in many ways. 
what's been meaningful about the, the biennial phenomenon, and we've gone to sort of, we've gone from five to sort of three hundred in, in in twenty twenty five years, has been has been the fact that they've been so much in the global south, and that they've you know the, the the quintessential biennial is actually you know Havana or Dakar, mm-hmm. you know, um, and uh, uh, in, in many ways it's been a a, 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 a form of infrastructure that has um, facilitated, I think, some of the exchanges that, uh, that, that Lillian's talking about. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, be interesting to think about, important to think about how that form can, inv- can evolve and continue to, to, to provide the service that I think it, it, it has provided in, in, in the 90s and early 2000s. Lena, I felt like you were going to say something. I oh, know, like, yeah, maybe yes. There's like this piece by Wally Trump, who was like invited to do an architectural design for the Beirut Art Museum, the Contemporary Art Museum. And he was actually third placed. Now he's second placed because the first one was out. And his idea was to build like a museum, like a tunnel, which connects all different places. Like this idea of a tunnel, which I found like very contemporary or post-contemporary, maybe like this idea of connections and within the system of tunnels, there are all this institution he imagined as an artist. Like there's an institution which is called like the institutions for grants you always wish for, the institutions for residencies you always wish for. So this idea of like a global network with this tunnel system combined with this idea of like ideal working conditions made me think about like what we talked before about like what are institutions because this is not an institution but it was like an actual design for an actual museum and it can happen if the second mm-hmm. one is bad out so it's kind of like this shift between a fiction like we clearly <laughs> don't build tunnels from Beirut to New York but like this idea of like how we shift reality into fiction or into like how we play with that made me think about like what you all said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's well, there's more than a few genres of contemporary art practice that are proposals or prototypes for institutions, right? Yeah. 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 Pado, do you see do you see uh, uh, ways in which uh, the institutions that you know need to adapt to better uh, support the work that needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been saying, I'm, I'm really speaking both literally about the pandemic, but also allegorically, right? And so the virus continues to evolve, and we have to as well. Um, and as I said at the top, like for all the geopolitical arguments for deglobalization, meaning that we're in deglobalization, I think the virus would suggest some other kind of simultaneity at a minimum, right? We have a global pandemic because of interconnectedness. But I love that you started us off with the idea of a weather report, Dominic. (laughs) And I'm thinking about maybe London or many parts of the world where you have to dress in layers, right? Because the day could have eight or 10 microclimates in a 24-hour period. And so I'm thinking about agility, not as a kind of affront to institutions or even an oxymoron, but what does it mean to have the things that I might intuit that you love, Tom, about institutions um, with a kind of agility. And um, I don't know how this may shift in a waning pandemic should we get there, but I think convenings and encounter are really, really special. And the pandemic's reminded us of that. Maybe that does or doesn't mean flying all over the world again at the scale we used to. I'll leave that as an open provocation question for myself. Mm -hmm. But I really wish we could be in a room together and then go get some food, right? Um, I guess we would need a tunnel that would allow us to time travel or something. But <laughs> I miss that. And I realize that, that there's tremendous questions of privilege and access that come with that. But I also think that with agility and thinking about accountabilities, the institutions I'm engaged in come with the question of what, what kinds of encounters, perhaps I'll say, and what kinds mm-hmm. of convenings. Encounter could be with the space of an artwork, right? It could be with one another. It could be with a an impossible proposal, but I think those are important. And then I would just add um, reciprocities at different scales. Mm -hmm. Reciprocity is in many ways an indigenous concept from the Americas, but, you know, people practice it all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, And it's an ethic of accountability and reciprocity. And I think when we talk about uh, the funding mechanisms for major institutions, we're in part wrestling with the decolonial and the reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Um, That may look like access. It may look like reparations. It may look like uh, decentering. 
but it might also be something well beyond the current terms that we're trying to wrestle with what we love about institutions and the violences that they embody and that mm -hmm. they still can mm -hmm. perpetrate. And that's a really hard thing we're working through. And, and it, those are some of the art institution versions, but we have them in many other sectors as well. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it strikes me that you know, in the in the in the in certainly in the U.S., but maybe um, elsewhere, uh, art criticism and just art discourse generally is at least as much about institutions now as about artworks, um, and that seems I think that was not the case a decade ago. Um, it's like the um, the critical thinking is around the the. The, the the structures in which contemporary art takes place a lot of time. Um, well, we we uh, uh, we went over our time. I got a pop up that said you can hang around if you like. You can still hang around, uh, but uh, um, uh, I know it's, it's it's late for some of us. Um, so listen, I really um, I really hope we all do meet, as Pato says, sometime and and have that meal. Uh, and uh, um, appreciate the chance to kind of just meet with you at least in this way. And uh, yeah, but thanks for your thoughts tonight. Thank you to everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. See Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.